everybody and welcome back to You Can't Win. This is Tom here and I'm joined by Don as usual. Today we are going to be taking a look at Afghanistan and the Taliban uh, with our good friend Ibrahim. He did an episode with us about the same topics uh, about a year ago or so, uh, maybe half a year. And, a year uh, and a half. year and a half. Okay, yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he's back. Um, so he has a lot of knowledge and expertise on the conflict and, and the region. And so, uh, yeah, he's uh, just a great resource for, you know, this, this type of stuff. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. My pleasure. Yeah, so where shall we start, huh? Um, so, I don't know, maybe do you want to just give a brief overview of what the situation is at this point, just for people who really aren't? you know, clued in. Yeah. So, um, well, when, when we last, uh, talked in, uh, I think February, 2020, that was just when the United States and the Taliban had signed a deal, uh, for the American withdrawal, um, by spring 2021, which got delayed a little bit. And, um, the, um, I think basically everyone was sort of dragging their heel, heels on it. Um, so this summer there was a, there was a, basically a Taliban, um, campaign across the country. And, from at least like the August onwards, they basically they captured the entire country almost in maybe a week or a week and a half um, with relatively with relative ease. So uh, basically, right now they're in charge at Kabul and most of Afghanistan, apart from a small pocket in the Panjshir. But um, that's basically the state of affairs right now, and obviously the United States. Who weren't expecting, um, you know, the government to, to fall that fast? They uh, they're basically trying to rush to get their, you know, their staff and their soldiers and their uh, Afghan um, allies uh, out. So there's a sort of a there's sort of a, an imbroglio at the at the airport in Kabul. Um, but they're they're scheduled to be out by the end of this month, so three days. Okay, well, we'll see if they if they hit that deadline, I guess. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the speed with which the Taliban retook the country, and how that uh, you know that wasn't really expected by the U.S. Uh, what do you think accounts for that, and why do you think the U.S. was uh, you know didn't, didn't expect it? Well, uh, the United States they they basically they'd been trying to you know do sort of state building in Afghanistan, and a big part of that was an Afghanistan government army and security institutions and things like that. But the problem with this was first of all a lot of it you know it existed on paper, but it it wasn't really that effective on the ground. Um, and the other problem was that in 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 making you know these sorts of institutions, the Afghan government especially. Uh, Ashraf Ghani, who is the who is ba- basically the Afghan ruler who left uh, who fled Kabul uh, two weeks ago or a week and a half ago, especially during his period since twenty fourteen, they've been trying to make these sort of state institutions, but they've been alienating a lot of the unofficial, uh, you know, commanders and uh, militias and what have you in Afghanistan, um, and some of it was on ethnic lines. So basically, when the Taliban attacked, a lot of them they either just melted away or they you know they stood aside. And uh, they they basically left the Afghan army high and dry, and it wasn't it wasn't a terribly effective army to begin with. Uh, so they fought hard, like you know, in one or two places, uh, like in Kandahar um, and Ghazni for a while, but they weren't really able to to withstand the Taliban once those other militias with whom they were allied they basically they stepped aside, uh, and this was mostly in the north and the west. So. Basically, the Taliban were able to take over those parts of the country very quickly, and that kind of stranded uh, the government. So it left Ashraf Ghani basically high and dry, and he and he uh, he fled. Uh, you know, very suddenly he fled Kabul. Um, actually, he fled before the Taliban were expecting to get into the city because they were. You know, I don't think they expected him to depart so fast. They were trying to have some talks or whatever about about you know a transition or whatever. But basically, once he fled, they they got into Kabul, and that that also took the United States by surprise because they had been expecting uh, Ghani to hold out, you know, at least in the capital for a while. Uh, and when he left, uh, you know, the, the, the basically the United States sort of panicked, and you know now they're rushing to get their staff out. They were they were 
are already uh, aiming to get out. Um, I think what Biden had originally said the deadline would be uh, like September eleventh. I'm not sure if he changed <laughs> it after that, but that was I think that was their goal. But um, the fact that the government basically crumbled before the Americans even expected it, that sort of led to this uh, chaotic situation where they're you know they're trying to get out of Kabul as fast as they can, and they had, you know obviously there's like there's thousands of American troops or you know, staff or whatever that you have in Afghanistan. And then there's also, you know, a lot of Afghan, you know, clientele or dependents or whatever you want to call them, um, working for them. So it's basically a, you know, sort of a chaotic situation. The airport is the only part of the capital that they're in control of at the moment. Um, and that's basically the part of the capital that is in mayhem right now. And there was also, uh, I think two days ago, there was also an attack there that was, uh, you know, was I think it was claimed by um, Daesh or ISIS or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, and then I know, actually, they, I heard the U.S. is now doing airstrikes against ISIS. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm not I'm not sure if, like, um, like, to me it seems like they're just kind of playing it by ear. So, obviously, these airstrikes were... Uh, uh, sorry, not these airstrikes. This attack on the airport was a uh, was a shock to them, so they had to they had to sort of make a statement, especially because they'd already been getting a lot of criticism for the way that they're leaving. Yeah. So I, I think they just bombed a part of Afghanistan where 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 the Daesh is expected to be. Um, they they said that they killed a planner, but you know they they didn't like give any names or anything like that, as far as mm-hmm. I know. Yeah. So it, it it might just be bluffing. I don't know, but sure. yeah. yeah, they're always killing the number two commander. <laughs> you know? yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Has there been more talk about what the new state is going to look like under the Taliban? Um, uh, I <clears> guess <throat> for uh, the previous week when we had earlier talked, it was kind of like there was there was a little bit of uh, it was still up in the air to some extent, and uh, they there were a lot of the. A lot of the talk was sort of just emphasizing sort of the things they wouldn't be doing kind of thing. It was like, oh, no, don't worry as much. We're not going to, you know, it's not going to be a return to uh, what you imagine it was like under the old Taliban and all that kind of stuff. But has like a new state sort of been emerging in terms of like who's going to be the experts in charge and things like that? So from what I've seen so far, as far as like, you know, bureaucracy or whatever, like, you know, uh, professional as far as professionals are concerned, they've they've more or less left them in their places. Uh, one reason that they were able to to capture Afghanistan so fast was because they basically they cut deals with a lot of uh, the you know political heavyweights who were who were ticked off with Ashraf Ghani. So um, so what 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 they're gonna have to do now is uh, you know sort of try to. Uh, uh, bring them into a potential of Taliban government. So uh, they've basically, like, I, I think this is probably their most serious uh, problem at the moment because uh, on one hand, they want, to, you know, they want the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Um, but on the other hand, they don't really have, they don't really have uh, experience in, you know, building these sorts of coalitions. Uh, like in the 1990s when they used to, um, you know, the, uh, even then a lot of their conquest of Afghanistan was basically by, cutting deals and stuff uh, but that was you know that was sort of a different situation in, in that there was you know there was a very long civil war going on and uh, the, the the people who defected to them they often defected at that time like you know they, they didn't really have a uh, other 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 political groups to defect to the ones that they used to belong to they, they were basically defunct or they were isolated so at that time the Taliban didn't they weren't really power sharing at least they didn't really have like a coalition government like if, if you join them you were part of the Taliban now what mm-hmm. they have to do is <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, you know there's a lot of experience and also like you know internationally very well connected uh, sort of Afghan um, power brokers who they have to who they have to uh, basically win over and they have to you know give them adequate uh, representation or whatever in a government um, whether that whether that's autonomy or whether that's you know a certain amount of cabinet seats or whatever but um you know this is sort this this is sort of a new experience for them actually i, I wrote an article for trt on this uh, the other day and what i what it, basically that was my point that they don't have exper- experience of governing in a coalition so 
um i'm not exactly sure uh what how they're going to like you know solve this problem um it, it might just be you know like you know they, they they give a certain quota of seats or something like that to these you know these these uh influential uh Afghan politicians or it might be that they that they do some sort of you know like regional autonomy or something but um it, I, I i think that it's not something that they have really prepared that well for they're 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 decent enough at administrating and at being, you know, politically united within themselves. But um, as far as making coalitions with, you know, opposition uh, groups, that's a new experience. So they they still haven't announced their government yet. So, you know, it's been almost two weeks. So mm-hmm. we're going to have to see you know, what happens. But whatever it's going to be, it's, it's definitely going to be, you know, dominated by, by, by their people. Um, actually, I was... I was thinking maybe there's a sort of comparison with you know in Yemen the the Houthis the Houthis are you know they they basically they rule Sana'a the capital of Yemen and most of northern Yemen um, and like you know most of the influential sorts of positions are in their control but they are technically still in a coalition with you know with with other factions in Yemen so uh, maybe maybe we'll see something like that. <clears throat> hmm. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of people, uh, like like Don was sort of referencing the idea of like a return to the 90s Taliban and, you know, executions in soccer stadiums and all that kind of stuff. It seems like they are really at least broadcasting a message of like, that's not what it's going to be like this time around. And yeah, uh, uh, I was just wondering what your you. take on, on that was. Well, yeah. Um... Uh, you know, there was there was a lot of talk about like you know like have they changed or are they you know they're just saying this for international consumption. Um, the thing is that you know um, in the, even in the nineteen nineties, uh, you know they, they had you know they had executions and things like that, but it wasn't it wasn't a gr- it, it wasn't like I'm uh, it wasn't as major an issue as it was sort of internationally. Uh, you know, it became kind of notorious. Sure. But I mean, um, you know, um, I, I saw a stat, and I don't remember where I saw it, but I saw this maybe three or four years ago. But it, it had a it had it had the number of executions at least officially that were there during their rule, and it wasn't it it was it was definitely less than you see like you know in places like Iran and maybe Saudi Arabia, and uh, I think it was maybe around it was maybe a little bit more or a little bit less than the number you see in the United States. So I don't think that there. I don't think that they're planning on doing away with like you know the death penalty or stuff like that, but as far as you know, um, as far as you know, having uh, these sorts of very ultra conservative or you know very strict sorts of you know uh, uh, you know recourse to uh, what do you call it? What do you uh, there, there's a thing that you call when you basically beat someone, corporal punishment, things like corporal that. Corporal punishment, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, corporal punishment. So uh, things like that. I think that they're they're at least trying to tone down. And I haven't seen a lot of that. I've seen one or two videos uh, of you know, like you know, some fighter or whoever, uh, you know, beating some civilians or whatever. But um, according to them, anyway, you know, they they took him in and they're and they're investigating and this and that. So we're going to have to see. But I don't think it'll be it'll be a recourse to that sort of you know that level of you know, that level of spare the rod and spoil the child type of, you know, worldview. But they're definitely, they're, they're definitely, I don't think they're going to be compromising on the, on, you know, the fact that they're, that they have a, you know, type of sort of very conservative or whatever you want to say, uh, idea of uh, law and order, uh, you know, which, which I'm sure it's going to include like, you know, the death penalty and executions and things like that. Maybe not sure. in soccer stadiums or things, uh, but, um, I, I would be surprised if they let go of that because I, I even like even now I've seen like you know videos of you know basically uh, thieves or looters or whatever who are basically being threatened um, you know occasionally slapped around or whatever um, and like these are on this is on their social media and you know they're basically saying that you know we caught these we caught these guys making trouble so you know people don't have to be afraid you know we're not gonna let we're not gonna let um, you know, basically criminals or, or troublemakers take over, uh, which is, I guess it's meant to be a reassuring thing, but, but at least from the international community's point of view, uh, it doesn't it doesn't look that reassuring. So um, we're going to have to see, but I don't think it'll be that level of 
you know, sort of, um, I don't even want to say tone deaf, but like, you know, <laughs> sort of, sort of uh, tone deaf, sort of, you know, like uh, brutality or whatever that we saw in the, in the 1990s. Yeah. I, I wonder how much of that was, uh, you know, you could maybe attribute to the like war conditions because there were plenty of, you know, similar sorts of things being done by various militia groups like Dostum, you know, is was famously kind of like they found mass graves and he would like lock people up in shipping containers and just like yeah. perforate it full of AK-47 fire and stuff like that. So, I mean, mm-hmm. I'm not trying to say like, oh, well, they're all bad, so it's OK. I just mean yeah. that maybe maybe it's, uh, you know, it won't be yeah. as uh, rough, you know. If things yeah, are well, more in order, or more in order. Yeah, 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 you have to remember that most of these Taliban people, when they took over in the 1990s, they were like people who were in their 20s, 30s, occasionally early 40s. But it was, it wasn't people who had been trained to govern or people who had a, like it was very much a makeshift sort of militia. Um, and you know, one one part of their appeal was that there was a lot of you know, sort of, at least at least in the area where they originated from, which was mostly southern Afghanistan, uh, it there was a lot of like you know, sort of societal chaos. You had like, you had checkpoints every few miles, and uh, you know, you had these sort of uh, sort of predatory militia. They were basically bandits at that stage. Um, so 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 when they when they captured places like Kandahar and all that, they were actually quite popular early on, and. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't really until they got to you know sort of bigger and more. Um, I don't want to say cultured, but more cosmopolitan or whatever cities like Kabul that uh, that they that they sort of became you know notorious for this for this uh, you know this sort of harshness. Um, and at least in Kabul, there was also you know there's sort of the impression in a lot of like you know a, a lot of rural Afghans. That you know, Kabul is sort of like a den of vice or whatever, um, and this has been like you know, this, this has been this has been going on for you know several generations. It's it's not something that started with the Taliban, but there was this idea that you know basically they have to sort of uh, they have to you know lay down the law or whatever in Kabul, um, and you know the irony is that 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 Kabul itself uh, it had been it had been probably the fiercest site of the civil war before the Taliban took over. Uh, you know, so for example, they used like girls' schools were you know technically open, but you know, if 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 you you were in most parts of the city, you were taking your life into your own hands basically if you're going to school because you could get abducted, you could get shot, you could get whatever. Yeah. So um, a, a, a lot of their a lot of their really weird edicts were sort of like a, an overreaction or like a very makeshift uh, response to that to that particular setting some of it was like um like you know i think the british uh, military commander last week he, he said something like you know it's basically country boys who are you know in charge of ruling a country mm-hmm. so you know some of it was like you know like these basically villagers who are who are in charge of you know a big city or in charge of a country or whatever and and this was their sort of makeshift uh, approach to it but a lot of things like you know um, and I think we discussed this last week but a lot of things like you know education and in particular girls education um, a lot of what was uh, what was uh, circulated about them you know as being kind of ideologically opposed to girls education because they hate women or whatever a lot of that was you know it was it, it wasn't really true and there were there were even studies at that time by you know people who worked in aid organizations and things like that who were saying, and this was in the late 1990s, they were saying that, you know, that a lot of the international sort of outcry against the Taliban, it isn't really justified or it or it misses the point. Because um, because the Taliban were not, you know, they were not, uh, they were not ideologically or dogmatically against girls' education. Uh, it was more of the sense of, you know, there was sort of very ultra-conservative sort of people who had, who were, whose main concern was sort of, you know, getting keeping girls separate from boys and part of right. that is you know that part of that is cultural part of that has to do with the with the prevailing situation at that time which you know there was obviously a lot of insecurity um you know most of these people had grown up in a very uh, destabilizing or whatever you want to call it but a very uh, in a very brutal war so you know it uh, their 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 responses to these conditions tended to be uh, you know, very drastic and very 
clumsy as well. Um, and you know, they were even back then. There were parts of Afghanistan, especially like in the eastern eastern areas, where there was a little bit more autonomy. Uh, but you know, there were places over there where there there were girls' schools running, and you know things like that. Uh, I don't think they were very good schools, but but uh, you know they were running for the record. So uh, a lot of the sort of international reputation that you know that these guys hate girls, and you know they're you know they're basically out to you know murder female students or whatever. Uh, a lot of that stuff was not uh, you know it didn't really have much basis in fact and. At least if you look at the Taliban insurgency for the last 15 years or so, uh, most areas under their control, they haven't, they haven't, you know, prevented girls from studying. They've, uh, or, or, you know, they, they haven't been particularly harsh in terms of, um, in terms of whatever you want to call it, their criminal justice or whatever. Um, there, there've been actually quite a few studies done on this and, um, like the general, the general view is that at least in rural Afghanistan, uh, the, their their interpretation of law or whatever is uh, was one of the things that won them a lot of support because <clears throat> even though it was it was harsh it was generally quick and it was generally it was generally fair too like you know uh, the, there wasn't a sort of oligarchy like you know that this guy's above the law or something like that right so yeah so it'll it'll it remains to be seen how they're gonna you know how how they're gonna govern on the international stage if it's gonna be if it's going to be better than it was back then, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sort of optimistic that at least, you know, that they've kind of realized because, you know, a lot of them have said this obviously, but also like, if you look at their governance uh, in the areas that they controlled before they took over Afghanistan entirely, but you know, in the areas that they controlled, like in parts of Helmand or whatever, uh, you didn't really have this sort of, you know, like, sort of wild overly over conservative sort of you know brutality going on um so from that point of view i am optimistic but then from another point of view uh, you could say that a lot of afghanistan at least a lot of urban afghanistan places like kabul they've also like you know it's it's not the same situation as it was in the 1990s uh you know there's a lot more international connect connections and things like that and you know there's a lot of you know sort of cultural influence whether that's from Western countries or from, you know, from India or Russia or whatever. Um, so how they deal with things like that, um, I, th- I think that could cause quite a bit of tension. But, um, you know, I, I, at the moment, I think there's more room for optimism than there is to, you know, to assume that they're going to be, that they're going to be terrible. Um, around that sort of like cosmopolitan Kabul kind of idea too, and uh, those international connections, do you think that the Taliban this time are going to try to emphasize just like international legitimacy even like in terms of like are they going to join the UN are they going to like are they going to be recognized by anyone are they going to be uh is it going to like sort of normalize into sort of like a typical state uh um yeah. and are there people helping them do that because it seems I guess that's the thing where uh I'm sure that they've learned a lot of these lessons themselves but it does also seem like there's some sort of assistance there of people that want to see a project up and running uh, better than, uh, you know, just uh, um, some sort of renegade state or something like that. Yeah. So so th- there's two angles to this. Uh, the first angle is that I think they're definitely more they're definitely more, you know, sensitive towards international opinion and stuff like that. Uh, and part of that does have to do with, you know, uh, First, firstly, their own sort of experience where they they were kind of you know they became a pariah state, uh, um, and secondly, also you know they, they, there's people especially especially you have like you know people in Pakistan or in or even you know even sort of like religious circles in Afghanistan who are trying to sort of shepherd them through uh, you know through sort of the becoming internationally respectable. Um, so, so there is that. Uh, but the the other thing is that even in the nineteen nineties, they you know they they were tr- they were trying to get UN recognition, um, and actually that was a big uh, you know that, that was one of their big sort of um, sort of uh, complaints against the international community, which was you know that we're basically r- running ninety percent of Afghanistan, and you're and you're you know you're basically isolating us. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think on I think on this occasion there has been more of an effort sort of to 
uh, you know, to sort of become a respected part of the international community. Uh, there's been a lot of diplomacy, uh, especially especially through Pakistan, but also like you know through certain other states. Like um, they've they've been relatively closer to Iran in the last five years uh, compared to during the 1990s when they were basically like you know enemies. Um, and there's also been like you know there's sort of been diplomacy with you know Uzbekistan and China and um, Russia. You know, so so I I think that there is an effort to. To, to become, you know, like uh, internationally legitimized uh, uh, parts of the international community. Um, I think I think they're, they're putting more emphasis on it now than they did in the past. Uh, because if you look at if you look at their rule in the 1990s, that was basically the the big disadvantage that they had compared to their rivals was the internationally dip- diplomatic one. So they might have conquered like whatever ninety percent of Afghanistan, but they were but they were not recognized except by like two or three countries as a uh, as the rightful government of Afghanistan. Um, and obviously, you know, with 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 that isolation, they, you also pay a price in terms of a- the economy and in terms of uh, you know j- just the normal things that you would normally ex- expect from from you know a, a state among several states there was there were a lot of uh, difficulties because of that so i think i think on this occasion they're at least putting much more emphasis on on international legitimacy um and i think uh, i i think part of this uh, also accounts you know for their more for their more open or more uh you know sort of more open mindedness compared to before uh so their greater open mindedness compared to before uh, about you know, social issues and things like that. Yeah, I, I think the warming of relations with Iran is kind of interesting um, because it really shows the like the sectarian issue is kind of, well, it, it's not as, uh, I don't know, volatile, say, as like in the Arab countries, right? Like, say, yeah, Syria yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the, the sectarian issue, um, like... You know, the, the, generally there's a the, like Afghanistan hasn't been short of sectarianism, but it hasn't been uh, it hasn't been like you know it hasn't been a driving factor for most factions in in Afghanistan. So, for example, in the 1990s, the Taliban they were they, one of their main opponents was the Wahdat group, which was basically a, a sort of like a union of different Shia commanders in different you know Shia interests basically uh, and generally with the Hazara ethnic group which is in central Afghanistan um, and so that was one of their ma- main rivals and um, they actually you know ex- sort of exchanged massacres with them too in the late 90s but um, but even 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 in on that case the the sectarianism followed the the politics so so for example in 1995 1996 uh Wahdat and Taliban leaders were you know they were trying to negotiate in fact the the Wahdat Amir was basically he was uh, killed by the Taliban during negotiations and basically basically uh sort of like a battle erupted uh they were trying to basically take him into custody when when they were supposed to be negotiating so there was like there was he basically he tried to escape and they shot him but it wasn't it wasn't like you know that oh you know this guy is a shia or whatever so you know just you know kill him or you know it wasn't things like that and even even for about 18 months after that they were they were even trying to uh negotiate with his successor uh abdul karim khalili who uh who is you know who's one of the people with whom they negotiated this this year he's uh he's he's one of the older shia uh leaders in afghanistan so, so it wasn't that, it wasn't that Shias and Sunnis were killing each other because you know the other person was a Shia or a Sunni. Uh, it was more to do with the political factionalism. Um, and you know, even 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 in these massacres that I talk about, uh, so basically, uh, the, uh, one of the Wahdat fronts they they massacred a bunch of Taliban in I, I guess nineteen ninety seven. And early 1998, and then the Taliban, when they captured uh, Mazar e Sharif, which is where the earlier massacre took took place, they killed probably around 2,000 uh, Hazaras, and uh, um, you know it was it was officially a rep- reprisal, but you know it it had very definite sort of you know sectarian sort of undertones. Um, but even even during that period, uh, you know the the Taliban did 
try to get the support of certain Shia clerics and you know things like that or certain factions. And similarly, Wahdat were allied with you know with Sunni rivals of the Taliban. So it wasn't that it wasn't that you know they both had sort of an eternal hatred for the other sect. Uh, that you would see in sectarianism, it was more that that the sectarian angle was following the politics. Sure. Uh, yeah. In in terms of Iran specifically, um, Iran's role is you know sort of interesting because you know basically since the Iranian Revolution, we've seen a lot of sectarianism both by their supporters and by their opponents. Like it sort of escalated uh, sectarianism, and part of that is you know from. Obviously, from their end, they sort of have this idea of a, a revolution through the Muslim world. Um, and, you know, from their opponents, uh, especially like, you know, the conservative like Gulf states like Saudi Arabia or whatever, they sort of play up the angle of, that you know, these guys are basically like almost like a fifth column or whatever. Um, so so bo- th- there's been a lot of escalated sort of social and, and political sectarianism because of th- this issue. But um, if you look at Iran's role in Afghanistan, it hasn't it hasn't followed a clear cut sort of pattern of you know supporting Shias. So, for example, this Wahhabi group that I'm talking about in the early 1990s, they were even even though the Wahhabi group were they were basically assembled by Iran in I think 1989 or 1990, uh, basically to represent Shia interests. But in 1992, they during the civil war, the start of the civil war, they joined uh, Hikmatyar's group. Uh, in fighting against the you know the official government of that time, which was le- led by Burhanuddin Rabbani, and Hikmatyar was a Sunni, Rabbani was a Sunni, um, but Iran in the, in in this fight they they sided with Rabbani's faction, in spite of the fact that they were f- fighting that Rabbani was fighting against the main Shia faction, and in spite of the fact that um, Rabbani's inc- uh, you know allies included some very hardcore like you know Saudi style Salafis. Yeah, uh, Salafis. Yeah, Salafis being generally, you know, having a mutual sort of dislike for uh, Shias. Yeah, are are so, you familiar with like the? You probably know this, but the the Wahda commanders. They actually, I, I my understanding is that they were bristling against Iran's, like they felt like Iran was a, was being too interventionist and in trying to like, com, like boss them around basically. Um, I think Iran was hoping to kind of model them on their revolutionary guard corps, and uh, so yeah. the f- from what I've read, the the Wahdat people accused the Iranian agents who were like w- they were working with of being CIA and, and just expelled them <laughs> from their areas. And maybe that's uh, I don't know the timeline on that, but that sounds like that might have occurred before this uh, you know this break where Wahdat went with uh, with Hekmatir. I, I I have not read about this, but I do know that before Wahdat was formed, uh, basically the different groups that formed Wahdat, there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of pro-Iran and anti-Iran uh, sort of factions amongst them. There right. were some of them that wanted to basically imitate the Iranian revolution. Yeah. Um, and then there were others that, you know, they sort of had a more, uh, you know, like sort of Hazara-centric or, you know, localized whatever sort of um, agenda. So uh, actually Iran, Iran is were the ones who kind of, you know, drew them together. And Iran generally, like, you know, they're they're not, uh, they're not, um, like, you know, even when Wahdat was against, uh, you know, their candidate in the early 90s, they, 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 they don't, they didn't cut off links entirely. But they were definitely, like, you know, they were sort of, I think, hoping to co-opt them into something similar to, you know, Hezbollah or, or um, you know some of these uh, other uh, Ira- Iranian-backed uh, militias in the Arab world. Yeah. Do you know if this yeah. was like before Qasem Soleimani sort of you uh, know, took I, the I role think, that I he think... had, like in Syria? So, so it was definitely before he took the uh, that role. But um, I mean, Qasem Soleimani, he was a field commander in the war against Iraq during the 1980s. So uh, I don't think he was that senior at the time that this relationship started. Yeah. Um, I, I think I'm not sure, but I think that this relationship was founded by uh, was actually started by Hossein Muntaziri, who was originally um, Khomeini's, yeah, you know, prospective uh, heir. Right. Um, and then and then he was he was basically he was sidelined a few months before Khomeini died, and instead Khamenei uh, succeeded Khomeini. Uh, but I think that it was uh, Montaziri who basically who sort of pioneered these links. Hmm. But I'm yeah, not they, exactly they could have used uh, yeah. they could have used Soleimani's Midas touch. I think you know. 
<laughs> yeah, they could have. Well, Soleimani by the by the by two thousand at least he was you know he was he was totally involved in Afghanistan and these sorts of things. I'm not exactly sure what, which year he took over. You know, the sort of a this sort of external viceroy sort of role that he had when he died or when he was killed. But um, I think it might have been around 1998 to 1999. And certainly when the United mm. States uh, invaded in 2001, he was, he was you know, he was uh, coordinating with them at that time. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, even, even with even with someone like uh, Soleimani, uh, who, you know, he, he ran a lot of, he ran a lot of militias in like, you know, in Iraq and Syria and what have you. Um, he, he also, you know, he also hired, at least in the 2010s when the Syrian war started, he hired a lot of, or he hired a lot of, um, Afghan Shias to serve, uh, you know, in the militia fighting in, in Syria. And, um, I, I'm pretty sure it was like, you know, I'm pretty sure this was like, you know, over 10,000 of them. And what I've heard is that some of these were, you know, just like, you know, basically Afghan refugees in Iran who were basically... You know, they're promised, like, you know, we'll take care of your family or whatever if you go fight for us. Um, but he, but basically, Iran Iran did, uh, did um, even in the, as late as the 2010s, they did, <coughs> they did hire, you know, these uh, um, Afghan Shias sort of to make a pal- or to make a paramilitary sort of group, uh, which is separate to Wahdat. But I do know that some of the Wahdat leaders were involved in that. So, um uh, I'm not exactly sure how you know how 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 much of a contrast there is uh, between Wahdat and between this group that Iran set up. Um, and recently, there was even a PBS documentary. Um, I think uh, I think by Najibullah Qureshi, um, which aired I think two months ago. But basically, you know, in in that documentary, they sort of they sort of raised a lot of fears about you know that when America leaves and. These uh, these Iranian-backed uh, Shia paramilitaries are going to, uh, you know, they're going to activate in Afghanistan. <laughs> um, so far, we haven't seen any, any evidence of that. Um, but you know, it may, maybe maybe if the Taliban don't perform to Iran's liking, or 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 if they alienate, you know, Afghan Shias or whatever, uh, maybe you'll see you'll see this sort of network play out in Afghanistan. But at the moment. At the moment, its its impact in Afghanistan has been like minimal so far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, have there are there other uh, groups that are at this point um, like setting up like uh, or still open resistance to the Taliban? Like uh, we had talked a little bit last week about um, maybe uh, in the Panjshir uh, some uh, groups still mm-hmm. remaining, and then I guess the big story of the last uh, week. Uh, internationally has been, you know, this uh, attack that we talked about briefly um, on the bases, on the, sorry, on the airports uh, yeah. by ISIS, they, they, they attribute it to. So uh, are, are either of those, you know, sort of uh, um, will be per- persistent conflicts, do you think, or, or are they going to, you know, uh, yeah, like what, so the- what, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so the the Panjshir, the in the case of the Panjshir, which is, um, I mean, I, I know you guys know, but just for the listeners, um, it's basically just northeast of Kabul. It's this valley, and it's it, it's been famous for a long time because Ahmed Shah Massoud, who is the <clears throat> most famous Afghan commander against the Soviets, he basically he ran sort of like you know almost like a mini state over there, and uh, he was basically he he was the biggest headache for the Taliban basically when they ruled in the 1990s and he was assassinated just before you know the 9-11 attacks so he has he was you know he's very well renowned internationally he had a lot of friends abroad now his son who is uh he had been negotiating with the Taliban but he's also I think he's trying to keep his options open he he has been uh he's sort of like the figurehead for these guys in uh Panjshir. Uh, I think they're they're actually led by uh, Amrullah Saleh, who is the who was the spy master like originally for Afghanistan after the American invasion. Uh, he has a lot of you know he has a lot of links with various intelligence agencies, um, and he was also the deputy for Ashraf Ghani before Ghani left. So um, I I believe he's the one who has uh, who has sort of you know arranged the sort of resistance or to the Taliban, but at, but. The difference between now and then for them is uh, that in you know in the nineteen nineties they still had a 
uh, they still had uh, sort of a route overland route to Tajikistan, and they had a, they had control over you know probably probably the northeast tenth of Afghanistan, so Badakhshan province, part of Tukhar province, and uh, you know this Panchir area. Uh, at the moment, the Taliban uh, when they did their when they did their offensive, they took over these border areas as well before they you know before they kind of closed in on Kabul. So I think they just by- bypassed the Panchir area. I think they didn't want to attack it if they didn't have to. Um, and even even after after you know this resistance sort of things uh, sprang up there, uh, the Taliban were at least originally they were trying to negotiate with them. And you know, so far from as far as I know, there hasn't actually been very heavy fighting. It's been more sort of circling each other and negotiating and you know a, a bit of bravado on the part i guess of the pancheries and you know a bit of attempting to be reasonable or whatever by the taliban and so that they don't have to fight there but so far there hasn't been an actual you know major battle or anything there yet as far as i know but uh, i don't think that there if there is a battle uh, i don't think that they're that they're going to i don't think that at least at least militarily i don't think it should give the taliban much trouble because they have the area surrounded which was not the case in the 1990s, um, and the other thing is that they have they have uh, less hostile neighbors this time around. Uh, back then, they were only the only neighboring country that was friendly to the Taliban was Pakistan. Now, today, most of their most of their neighbors are, uh, if not friendly, then at least like you know willing to cooperate with them. So that that might be a, that might be a problem for these guys in the Panjshir. But um, you never know if there's, you know, if, if there's sort of like a long drawn standoff or a siege or something, uh, and coupled with the fact, and coupled with like, you know, if if the Taliban get isolated um, economically or or politically or whatever, which is, I think, I think that's what Amrullah Saleh is hoping for. But um, then you know you might see similar sorts of groups spring up in the areas that that had defected to the Taliban earlier this month. So the areas in the north and the west that I talked about that had basically they'd stepped aside and they let the Taliban take over, uh, mm. you know, they, they, they might, you know, think about switching sides again. Uh, but I don't think that's a huge problem for the Taliban at, at the way things stand anyway at the moment. Um, as far as Daesh is concerned, the thing with them is that a lot of these are uh, guys from the eastern border with Pakistan. A lot of them had been part of the "quote unquote" Taliban insurgency against uh, Pakistan. Uh, I say "quote unquote" because you know they they were also called the Taliban, but they were basically you know to all to all uh, intents and purposes they were entirely different, uh, like separate. Um, and basically, what happened with this with them was that in 2014, when Pakistan basically they mounted a big at- attack on their the Pakistan army, they mounted a big attack on their last stronghold. Uh, in North Waziristan, then basically th- these groups sort of fragmented, and this was the same time that you know the the Daesh Caliphate was taking over Iraq. So a lot of them, uh, a lot of them, they basically you know they sort of joined Daesh and you know uh, tried to get support from that from that uh, angle, um, and some of them even had links uh, to at least parts of Afghan intelligence at that time. So um, you know th- there were cases where you know where, where the you know a, a Daesh front when it was attacked by the Taliban, they would they would literally, they would just, you know, move into government control territory and disarm there. So, you know, that led to a lot of, you know, like sort of theories about, you know, collusion or whatever. Uh, but certainly, cer- certainly during Ashraf Ghani's period, Afghan- the government was less worried about Daesh than they were about the Taliban. So, uh, so it's, it's very likely that, you know, that, that in some cases they either turned a blind eye or they, you know, they sort of... Uh, sort of colluded with them so what 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 seems to be the case right now with daesh is that uh uh basically when the taliban took over um kabul um i i think maybe maybe uh you know there were maybe daesh cells or whatever who were among the people who were released from prison or there might have been some sort of you know infiltration within the taliban or something else but basically they managed to you know they managed very easily to breach the taliban security and also the American security and bomb this uh, this um, airport, and that led to that led to a lot of mayhem. You know, there was like uh, you know there were like shots sort of by fired by you know panicking American soldiers as well, and I guess stampede or whatever. And basically, 
around 100 people ended up getting killed. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure if this is more of a, you know, like sort of a Daesh attempt to destabilize the Taliban or if it's, uh, or if it's, you know, or if it indicates a bigger sort of potential for them to actually hold, you know, capture territory or whatever from the Taliban. Because um, certainly by the end of 2019, the Taliban, they had a, they had three or four years of very major fighting against the, the Daesh front, which was mainly in eastern Afghanistan. And they managed to, to, you know, they managed to wipe most of them out. And it was it was pretty bloody. I remember I I have an Afghan friend here uh, from from that area uh, who is, you know, he has relatives in that area. And he was saying that, you know, the, the Taliban guys, they would they, 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 they would negotiate with the government, but they wouldn't negotiate with these guys. Uh, you know, they, you know, if they if they caught them, they basically they killed them on the spot. So it was very fierce back and forth fighting. And from what I, from what I know, the the Taliban basically, um, you know, they basically they drove them out of that area of Afghanistan. Um, so it it might just be that Daesh uh, are just you know they're just kind of making themselves felt with these sorts of attacks. We sort of saw something similar when. There was a campaign against them in 2015, 2016 in Iraq and in, in Syria. But um, if you remember back then, uh, you know, it, it wasn't until they started to lose a lot of ground internationally that they started mounting these sorts of very, you know, bloody terrorist sort of attacks in places like, you know, Paris and uh, mm -hmm. the United States and places like that. So it, it could just be, you know, it could just be a, a repeat of that, uh, that, you know, that it's a sign of... That, that it's more of a political, you know, sign than than a sign of any hold staying power. Right, sure. But uh, we'll have to see because that area of Afghanistan, eastern Afghanistan, it's always been, it's always been like even during their nineteen nineties, the Taliban they had a very uh, tenuous control over it. So uh, we'll have to see. <clears throat> it's not an easy place, basically, for uh, for any government or for any single faction to control. Um, sort of to reverse the question in a certain way. Uh, one of the sort of major American, uh, at least stated kind of purposes of being in Afghanistan was to prevent Afghanistan being sort of like a launch pad for planning for attacks and things like that. Um, yeah. whether, whether or not that's true or not, you know, that's just a separate thing, but like yeah. the, the, um, you know, the existence at least of ISIS, Daesh, whatever, uh, will the new Taliban government be cooperating, do you think, and trying to figure out ways of not being uh you know having pockets of people maybe trying to attack internationally or things like that or is that not uh, a real concern? Uh, i i think in the in the case of of daesh who are you know they're very openly hostile to the taliban a lot of bad blood i think yeah. in that case they would definitely be open with to working with foreign countries maybe not the united states just because they they don't trust them Sure. Uh, even today, after after you know American airstrikes, the the Taliban government or whatever they, or the Taliban political office, whatever, or spokespeople, they they were you know they, they sort of criticized they they criticized the Americans for, uh, for bombing that area. But um, I don't uh, I think I think they don't really trust the United States. Um, at least at least if they're if they're you know if their supporters are anything to go by or their foot mm -hmm. soldiers or whatever uh, there's a lot of suspicions that the united states is in you know in league with uh daesh or um which which i think a lot of that just reflects the fact that that uh the united the government that the united states had backed <clears throat> part at least part part of its intelligence was you know uh they kind of were turning a blind eye to them so mm -hmm. you know i guess to the taliban this might look like you know the americans are in cahoots with them um, so I'm not sure if they're going to be cooperating with the United States over that. They might if if Daesh actually becomes a big threat to them. Uh, but I do think that they're going to be cooperating with like um, um, you know places like Pakistan, maybe China, uh, Iran. Although although Iran is at the you know on the other side of Afghanistan, but um, one of the one of the pretexts for their uh, for their sort of a thaw with the Taliban was that you know the Taliban were a better alternative compared to Daesh so <clears throat> so you know um, they, they, they might get help from Iran or Pakistan maybe from China uh, over, uh, over this issue uh, I, I, I don't think they would be very open to co-working with the United States unless they had to <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
Sure. So. Oh, and actually, actually, sorry. Uh, let me just add this. Um, actually, someone was asking me today. Uh, you know, like you know, what about Al Qaeda? Because you know, Al Qaeda was you know the original sort of pretext for the invasion. Mm-hmm. Um, the the thing with Al Qaeda is that you know uh, the, their leader Zawahiri. I'm not. I'm not exactly sure where he is. He might be in Pakistan. He might be in. He might be in Afghanistan. Yeah, we haven't seen um, him for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I know that there are not very many Al Qaeda people in Afghanistan. There's probably a maximum of a couple of hundred. Um, so, uh, in, in the case of Al Qaeda, you know, trying to trying to sort of you know keep mounting attacks on the West, <coughs> I think I think that'll be very interesting to see because the Taliban don't have this sort of hostility towards Al Qaeda that they do towards Daesh. Um, and if anything, Daesh sort of forced them to work closer with Al Qaeda, just because you know the enemy of my enemy. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know they don't want they don't want Al Qaeda to screw it up for them the way they did earlier. So, so the, I, I I think I think that's uh, you know it, it'll be interesting. That that depends on a lot of different factors. You know whether or not Zawahiri and these guys are even in Afghanistan. Um, you know. If the if the, if the Taliban have the sort of resources to keep them under control, or you, you never know, even extradite them. I I don't think they would extradite them, but um, you know, it, uh, I don't think it's totally out of the question. Um, but but Al Qaeda is I think Al Qaeda is more interesting from an international security point of view, just because they're not they're not hostile to the Taliban the way that you know the way that Daesh are. So mm-hmm. um, you know, the fact that the Taliban are are trying to cooperate with international security sort of efforts to you know not let afghanistan be used for terrorism or whatever uh you know that that kind of runs counter to their friendship with the al-qaeda uh, faction so uh that i think that's a very a much more uncertain question and i think a lot of that depends on what sort of uh you know what sort of uh, engagement there is with the taliban uh, uh i i think that the more the more the more sort of international uh, diplomacy or trade or whatever you want to call it uh, with the Taliban that there is sort of in helping them to kind of set up shop um, I think the less inclined they would be to work with Al- Al- Al-Qaeda <clears throat> Alright, so I think yeah. now would be a good time to get into some of our questions uh, we had some from our Discord um, so that's one of the perks of being on the Discord people, you get to be, you know, we, we let you know when we have a special guest coming on and, and if we have like specific questions for that episode, we'll usually put that on, on the Discord here. So, uh, yeah, let's just get right into it. The first one is from Sami. He says, why didn't the Afghan government hire PMCs, uh, Wagner or Blackwater types to shore up defenses like Haftar did in Libya because his militia sucked Okay, so uh, they actually did. They, they actually did hire uh, quite a lot of uh, mercenaries, um, and I, I, I think they did it through the United States. At least m- most of it, because uh, at least for most of the last ten years, there have been more. There have been more, you know, contractors uh, fighting in Afghanistan than there have been, you know, actual American soldiers or foreign soldiers, and you know, m- one of the reasons for that is obvious, which is that you know they're they're it, it's politically, you know, not that risky because, you know, if it's if it's a contractor, then the government can't be held accountable for you know dead Americans, right. um, and then you know they, they they generally don't have those sort of rules of engagement, <clears throat> so uh, you know they they can basically kind of get their hands di- a little dirty, and then obviously for things like um, you know for, for things like maybe espionage or you know sort of specialized sorts of tasks. Uh, they're a more useful weapon for that sort of stuff, uh, you know, just because they're professional. They're they're basically you know they're mercenaries, so they can do what they like. So they have had that those for a long time, and um, even even now, uh, Eric Prince, I believe he was uh, he was offering Afghans uh, sixty five hundred dollars uh, to get out of you know each to get out of uh, the Kabul airport, basically for him to I guess escort them out. So you know he's he's still grifting, and uh, the 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 mercenaries have definitely had a very big role. In fact, um, uh, I was talking to one of my uh, I guess one of my dad's friends 
I should call him, but uh, you know, he's very interested in you know, sort of you know, basically these sorts of issues, modern war and stuff like that. So he was saying, you know, that if you compare the American casualties uh, in in uh, in Afghanistan compared to the casualties in Iraq. Then you know the Iraq War was much bloodier, and you know, he's basically saying the Afghanistan War was sort of like a distraction. Uh, but then the the thing with that was that he had been looking at you know the soldiers, and in terms of soldiers, definitely the United States uh, wanted a uh, uh, sorry not wanted they lost a lot more soldiers in Iraq. But in terms of uh, contractors, if you add in the contractors, it's uh, I think the num- the number uh, almost triples. So I think there were almost twice as many contractors killed. No, no. There were, I think, 2,400 American soldiers killed and somewhere around 3,500 contractors killed wow. in Afghanistan. Yeah. So it, it was, uh, you know, one and a half times as much, basically. So, uh, you know, they've definitely played a very big role. And I think that's also one of the reasons that the war is not sort of that, that uh, you know, that uh, well-known in, you know, the sort of public, public imagination. <clears throat> Compared to Iraq or compared to you know even Vietnam and places like that earlier, uh, because a lot of it was basically a private war, and even even you know you have some uh, some some parts of the Afghan military uh, who were you know who who have sort of contracting companies of their own. So uh, Sami Sadat, who is this uh, who is this uh, who is the commander of Lashkar Gah, and he's sort of one of those <clears throat> media friendly sort of. Uh, officers in the Afghan army, you know, they get a lot of coverage. They, you know, sort of have a soundbite for every occasion, those sorts. So he, he himself, he runs a, he runs a, you know, a, a PMC. So uh, there was definitely a lot of this sort of stuff in Afghanistan, and um, I think, I, I, I think to some extent, it's, it's almost un- unavoidable in these sorts of places where you know you have a. You have a weak state. You have a sort of very fragmented sort of country. So in these sorts of places, um, uh, militias tend to work better than you know a, an official state army. And you you can even trace that back to the Soviet invasion when a lot of the militias that we see nowadays in Afghanistan they were basically formed during the 1980s uh, with Dostum's militia being a very you know, very obvious example. So it's it, it has been a private war for a long time. But the other thing with you know, contractors is that they're not, they're not suicidal. They're not going to, uh, you know, they're not going to keep fighting for a cause that <clears throat> doesn't pay. <laughs> sure. um, and you know, with the with the with the political mayhem in the Afghan government, and it was basically a very dysfunctional sort of uh, coalition uh, ruling Afghanistan. Uh, so you know, it's it's not the sort of thing that too many contractors would want to stick around for once the going got tough. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right well, let's uh let's go on to the next one this is from note to self uh they ask how was the cia u.s intelligence so disastrously wrong about how long it would take for the taliban to retake afghanistan so we kind of discussed this a bit earlier that you know there was like this state building effort over the years and that on paper it looked pretty good but then in actual fact on the ground it was not so effective is there anything you wanted to maybe add to that um so well the, 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 there was that there was also sort of i think a, a political culture and that you know that sort of uh, basically the higher up you go the more uh, inclined you are to give good news mm-hmm. so it's so sort of like politicized information because you often hear from you know like from people who are sort of low-ranked soldiers or low-ranked officials that you know that they're almost like whistleblowers they say like you know you know I knew that this war was going south or whatever. Actually, I heard an interview with one of them today. Um, it was on it was on art it was on Russia Today. Who, obviously, they're they're you know kind of enjoying the Americans swarming, but they interviewed one of the, these American veterans who I think he was a major, and he was saying that basically when he when he used to raise stuff like this to his superiors, he basically he got sidelined. Um, he got sidelined because you know they didn't want to hear the bad news. So there was that, and then. Also, um, from what from what I've seen of CIA intelligence on Afghanistan, most of this is, is like twenty year old stuff, so it's a little easy for me to say now. But like a lot of it was almost amateurishly bad, like yeah. like um, like in the, like you know literally you know mixing up the names of this commander on the government side with the name 
of a Taliban commander or mixing up, you know, a very prominent Afghan political figure with some uh, Taliban leader. Um, I mean, to be fair, the well, names are uh, like Abdullah, yeah. Abdullah. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So and I mean, often people use uh, you know like honorifics and stuff sure, too, right? Yeah. So you know, like they say Mullah or or you know like Doctor or whatever. So so that also makes it more confusing. Um, and you know what? Uh, this is all this like I'm kind of going off track, but this has kind of been a pet peeve of mine. Is that when when you know writers and people like that when they refer to all these guys only by their honorific or by their name like Mullah Umar uh, because because most of these guys they have sort of like a nom de guerre uh, to d- distinguish them from you know from their pal who has a similar name mm-hmm. uh, and it hardly ever gets used and this thing like this really annoys me because I don't know how many times I've seen people mix you know mix up very obviously different people um, so I know that there's at least five different guys called Mullah Abdul Manan in the Taliban who who I've seen mixed up I don't know how many times uh, same with like Abdul Salam and you know names yeah. like that which are very common obviously Afghan names and then you have names like you know like you know Muhammad Agha things like that so <laughs> yeah my, my point being that you know you know nicknames exist use them <clears throat> yeah fair enough yeah um Okay, so yeah, we can we can move on then. So this one is from For Sale, Baby Shoes Never Worn. Uh, with the protests and attempts to flee, it seems that the Taliban isn't particularly popular, at least in Kabul. Does this indicate either a popular desire for a less problematic Sharia or for secularism? Um, I don't think it, it indicates a desire for secularism. Even the, even the. You know the, the Afghan, most of the Afghan government that preceded the Taliban, uh, or were fighting against them. Most of them, at least, you know, they at least paid lip, lip service to being an Islamic Republic or whatever. Um, and you know, they they actually had some very hardcore sorts of cler- clerics and stuff on their side too. Um, I, I, I think what part of it is just you know obviously there's this sort of twenty year, twenty year superpower occupying the country that's suddenly leaving on relatively short notice uh so you know people are sort of panicking about that a lot of these are you know people who either worked for them or who could be implicated uh you know in uh they they could be implicated as you know uh, being connected to them and you know even though the taliban have said that you know they're going to give an amnesty and all that stuff uh you know they, they might very well do that but uh you know you don't want to take your chances um so I think a lot of there's a lot of people who like I I don't think this is anything that that indicates either a mass unpopularity of the Taliban. Although I do think that at least in Kabul they they are very unpopular for both genuine reasons and also you know most of the Afghan war was based like like the the Taliban's enemies were based in Kabul. There's sort of like you know sort of like a bubble over there, uh, you know where you know the Taliban are, you know, basically terrorists and, you know, the basically the worst thing imaginable. So, you know, for these people, uh, it's a mixture of these different factors. It's it's A, people who worked with the, the Americans. It's B, people who, who might be, who might see themselves as being confused with people who worked with the Americans. C, uh, you know, people who might just be vulnerable under a change of government. Uh, and then D, there's, you know, obviously there's people who have, who have been basically brought up believing that you know the Taliban are you know basically kid killing you know barbarians who want to you know chase them under their beds and bayonet them or something I don't know so it's it's these things but I don't think it, it I don't think it, it indicates I don't think it indicates a an overall like level of unpopularity for the Taliban across the country um, I think they're definitely more popular or less unpopular than most people think. Uh, because most of the reporting and stuff has been done around Kabul or like one or two other cities uh, in the last 20 years. And then the second thing is that um, it definitely doesn't indicate, uh, uh, you know, wanting a secular law sort of thing or secularist law. Um, because as I said, you know, just about everyone, unless you're like a communist or something, uh, in Afghanistan, you're going to be at least at least nominally, nominally uh, you know, loyal to some sort of uh, uh, Islamic law or some you know variant of that. <clears throat> sure. Okay. 
So just real quick, you you would say that like in terms of popular support um, in Afghanistan for the Taliban is maybe relatively high, would you say, or how would you phrase it maybe? Um, I would say there's parts of Afghanistan where they are popular. There's parts of Afghanistan where they're not popular, but they're seen as better or less bad than the alternatives. Yeah. Uh, there's probably parts of Afghanistan that are just, you know, going with the flow, you know, whoever comes to yeah, power. Yeah, that's my impression. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and um, you know then there is parts of Afghanistan where they're you know very much despised. But um, you know what you what you normally hear are people who assume that you know like all over Afghanistan everyone hates them, which is you know it's it's not true. They're not they're not uh, sort of a unique alien sort of uh, force in Afghanistan. Sure. Um, they're much closer to some Afghan factions than those Afghan factions, or are compared to other Afghan factions. Mm-hmm. So, if that makes sense. Right. Um, okay, so the next question is from born to ready uh, He asks, do you think Afghanistan is headed towards civil war? Um, <clears throat> well, in, in one respect, it has been a civil war for, like, you know, like, basically, I mean, even what Biden said was something along the lines of, you know, we, in, we intervened in an Afghan civil war, which, which was the truth. You know, they had been... There had been a civil war going on since, uh, you know, since the nineties, arguably since the eighties. Yeah, or even if you want to draw uh, it back United to States. the sixties, I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but so there, there'd been some. There, there, there's been at least some level of civil war at, in at least some part of the country for probably fifty yeah, years or with so. With the occasional foreign um, power just showing up and, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so, so there are definitely civil. War. I think. Um, uh, are are we going to see something along the sides, you know, of everybody against everybody, sort of war that we saw at some stages in the nineteen nineties? I don't think we're going to see that. Um, I think one advantage that the Taliban have compared to most of their opponents is that they're not <clears throat> they're not a regional militia, or they're not like you know, like they they have they have branches or you know considerable bodies of support uh, in most parts of the country. Um, so that that's one advantage that they have, and um, they're they're not the only group that has ever had this. Even the main groups that fought in like 1992, which were uh, Burhanuddin Rabbani's group and Hikmatyar's group, both of these were also kind of like countrywide groups. Um, but generally speaking, the Taliban haven't had a lot of you know defections or uh, you know a lot of like you know people breaking away and making their own group things like that. Um, uh, they haven't really fragmented in the way that some of these other groups have done over time so uh in, in that in that respect it kind of bodes better because you know the more the more different factions there are in a war the more the less likely you are to resolve it basically um and that you know that is basically the case that happened like around 93 94 where you had like you know half a dozen probably more than half a dozen 10 different factions or so in afghanistan plus a lot of <clears throat> Un, uh, you know, unaffiliated sort of militias. So I, I think from that point of view, uh, I don't think we're likely to see something along the lines of what we see, for example, in Libya or, you know, somewhere like that where you have, you know, dozens of different militias who are just, al- you know, shifting allegiances every couple of months. Um, uh, but I, uh, I do, I do think that that if the Taliban can reach some sort of you know, some sort of reasonable deal with at least at least uh, the bigger groups. Uh, uh, so you know that 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 could include <clears throat> that could include the Jamiat group. That could include the his his group. That could maybe include some of these uh, you know sort of uh, regional commanders or whatever. Uh, if if they're able to reach some sort of deal with them, maybe maybe some sort of autonomy or maybe some sort of you know uh, shifting. Uh, like you know, rotation in power or some sort of quota in the government. Then I think I think there's definitely a much better potential for peace right now than there would be. Uh, like you know, than there than there was say five years ago or ten years ago. Um, generally, obviously, generally, uh, the foreign powers in entering a con a competition, uh, they it doesn't normally uh, de-escalate the situation. So even when we saw the United States enter in 2001, and a lot of people assumed it was like, you know, like a hegemon, and they would kind of, you know, force everyone to get along. 
but you know by 2003 2004 we saw a lot of you know warlords and stuff like that basically fighting each other we saw different parts of the government sort of at each other's throats there wasn't really this sort of unification and <clears throat> part of the reason was that a lot of these people some of them were favored by the americans over others so for example ashraf ghani who was the finance minister at that time he was favored by the americans over ismail khan who was the commander in herat and they were basically they were competing over the border revenue so <clears throat> on one hand you had you know sort of intensified competition between these uh, groups that were te- technically technically both on the american side and then you had the americans you know intervening on behalf of one over the other so so there's sort of a theory that you know sort of a hegemon is going to is going to uh, force everyone to unite but i don't think it's usually the case at least in terms of a foreign power entering so the fact that a foreign power is leaving uh you know whatever the intentions are, uh, were for its entering and for its leaving um i think i think potentially it's definitely a good uh it's definitely a good sign uh it's it's a healthy trend and uh it's something that the different parties in afghanistan should take advantage of you know sort of sort of hammering out a compromise on their own terms <clears throat> yeah we were talking off air a little bit about i i mean i was just saying that i i really you know whether it's the taliban or whoever's in charge i i just like hope for peace and stability in the country like i think that's the best thing yeah um yeah, and, uh, hopefully the Taliban can make some sort of arrangement, like with the uh, you know the groups you're talking about in, in the Panjshir and on the the eastern border. If they can, yeah, you know, pull that off and just keep things peaceful for a while, I think that would be really great. And then maybe the Taliban evolves to look something similar to like the Iranian Republic or something along those lines, like it's Islamic and all that, but it's not like some sort of ISIS style, you know. Just brutal yeah. thing. Like, yeah, like Perea type thing. Yeah. Um, well, one one like one positive thing you could say is that, like like I said, the Taliban are relatively you know they're relatively cohesive and disciplined. Um, so you know if if they can if they can sort of if they can sort of make some sort of arrangement with you know ABC other group. Um, I I don't think they would have a lot of problems in implementing it. That was one of the problems in the 1990s, right? Uh, You know, the political leader, like someone like Burhanuddin Rabbani might make a deal with some opponent, but he had no way of really enforcing it uh, because he didn't really have, you know, he didn't really have any power on the ground. So, yeah. Sure. Uh, All right. So let's let's move on to the next one. Uh, This is another one from Born to Ready. He's asking, how likely is it that the Taliban compromise with secular elements in Afghanistan? If that happens, what do the hardliners in the group do? Um, secular elements, in the sense of, um, uh, you know, in the in the sense of, um, you know, not wanting religion and politics. I I I don't think that they are going to compromise with them. Either they're going to exclude them, or they're going to, you know, they're going to f- force them to, you know, to. Uh, maybe into exile, maybe maybe lock them up. Or that's whatever. a that's a relatively I'm not sure minor uh, element, right? Like yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a pretty small part of Afghan society. Um, <clears throat> so so, I don't think it's it's something that uh, that that should be too much of a problem. Even if we look at like you know like historical sort of secularist groups in Afghanistan, whether that's the communists or whether that's you know ethnic uh, ethno national sort of groups but generally speaking these groups had to they, they, they had to uh they had to attach themselves to some religious group or other um that's actually what happened with uh with some of these uh sort of ta- tajik ethno nationalists in the early 1990s a lot of them had been fighting against Ahmad Shah Massoud who was of course he was a commander of the Jamiat party which is like a muslim brotherhood type of party um, and then a lot of them, they basically, you know, they, they sort of toned down the secular aspect and they just joined him based on their, you know, common regional or ethnic uh, interests. So, so, so I think maybe we're going to see something like that happen. But yeah, I, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of different factors, basically a lot of like fluid factors that depend on this. But I don't think that, that they're going to uh, compromise with secular groups to the extent of, you know, like excluding religion from 
from politics or things like that, or you know, not not applying whatever form of Islamic law, things like that. I don't think they're going to compromise on that. <clears throat> sure. So I am looking at the other mailbag that we have for questions, and there's actually a few here as well that are actually specifically directed to you. So I think uh, I should I should ask them. Um, so one of them just says, remember to ask Ibrahim about the Amrullah Saleh thing, which I think you mentioned him, right? Yeah, yeah, I mentioned it, right? He was the, he was the, basically, he was formerly like the sort of spy chief uh, in the Afghan government. Uh, before that, he used to be sort of a liaison for Masood <clears throat> during the war against the Taliban. So he used to liaison with you know different sorts of uh, foreign um, intelligence agencies, India's, Tajikistan's, uh, the United States, these sorts of intelligence agencies. Um, then he became the deputy for um, Ashraf Ghani. And actually, at that time, a lot of people praised him for like at least a lot of Americans they praised him for that because they said, "Oh, you know, there's this Tajik guy who's who's allying with uh, Ashraf Ghani over over you know regionalist sort of Tajiks." But um, you know, his his whole thing, his whole shtick is basically uh, that he is very very hostile to the Taliban to the almost to the point of like like fanatically hostile to them. So I wasn't I wasn't surprised that he didn't make a deal with them. Uh, he ended up going to the puncher and he's basically he's basically organizing the sort of uh, insurgency or whatever you want to call it resistance over there. Um, but I'm not sure how how far he's going to get. I think one advantage he has is that a lot of he has a lot of you know he has a lot of uh, friends you know in the CIA or in you know the Indian intelligence in uh, I actually Tajikistan wanted to ask you about that there's a lot of uh, yeah. you know politics geniuses on Twitter who are seeing this group in the New York Times and stuff and uh, you know just immediately assuming oh this is CIA so you, you think there's a little bit of validity to that uh, well being being in touch with the CIA or being close to the CIA doesn't necessarily mean that you know that every move is approved by the CIA. Right, sure. So he definitely has a lot of friends in the CIA and, you know, in the in various different intelligence agencies. Uh, maybe they're going to, I don't know, end up supplying him or something like that, maybe by ear, I don't know. But um, but it's it's not necessarily the case that he's uh, that he's being backed by them at this point. Um, I do know that a lot of a, a lot of a lot of them are very sympathetic to him, and a lot of uh, you know uh, you know Herbert McMaster, who was the national security advisor. <clears throat> he basically he, he he was in Afghanistan for a while, and he uh, he basically he, like you know Amrullah Saleh was his point man. So you know these sorts of people, they still have influence and uh, you know especially in terms of you know uh, lobbying and stuff like that uh, not just in the United States but you know there, there, there are similar characters you find in uh, in in various different countries and I think India is the other big one right now that's uh, very alarmed at uh, how things have transpired in Afghanistan so th- this is sort of an advantage that Amrullah Saleh has but um, I don't think it I, I would need to see more proof to see that his current, you know, resistance or whatever is being backed by, is being, you know, actually backed uh, materially and stuff by the CIA or whoever. I do know that the Indians are definitely very much like, you know, they are very much backing him because, mm. um, you know, very old links again. And India is, I think India is probably more, more alarmed about what has happened in Afghanistan than probably any other country, including the United States. Yeah. That, that so makes a lot of sense. Kind of been in like, panic because mode. I know Indian intelligence yeah. is very like deep in uh, Tajikistan, and, and yeah, yeah, so, very much. Uh, yeah, that that would make sense if they have a lot of links. You know, essentially Tajik yeah. groups or uh, you know majority. Groups. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 in in the case of uh, in the case of uh, Tajikistan, basically in the you know late nineties up to two thousand one, uh, the assistance to to the Taliban's opponents was being. Uh, channeled from Tajikistan by you know by Indian intelligence by Russian by any number of intelligence at that time, so uh, of intelligence agencies at that time. So all this is like you know like uh, for India's regional policy, uh, like you know there's no worse actor for them than the Taliban. It's yeah. like you know it's uh, it's literally upending their their entire regional strategy. Um, and in, in the same way, you know, the 2001 invasion was sort of like, you know, it was seen as a, 
it was seen as you know the trump card for them basically that you know this is a uh, that basically they had won sort of this war by persuading the united states to enter on their side so um india is definitely very very much you know on 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 board with the with whatever what whatever can hurt the taliban basically um i i'm not sure if i mentioned i think i might have mentioned last week but you know there was a very a very like noticeable indian sort of disinformation or propaganda or whatever you want to call it mm-hmm. campaign in the last two or three months um uh about afghanistan you know fake accounts and you know uh sort of alarm alarmist or whatever you want to say sort of stories and like uh, the the thing is that there's obviously there's propaganda on the other side too um but but for whatever reason i i think it's probably because the indians had sort of outsourced their afghanistan strategy to the united states so they were sort of caught off guard when the u.s left but uh their 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 misinformation or whatever it tends to be like you know very very clumsy very uh like it it it, it tends to be very transparent yeah like you know sort of relying on outrage and stuff like that to an extent that it isn't really believable. Like, I mean, I've, I've seen I've seen Taliban propaganda. I've seen quite a lot of Pakistanis, you know, who support the Taliban, whether that's, like, you know, official figures or unofficial figures. Uh, but, but you know, you, even, even their propaganda, it, it tends to be, like, you know, the Taliban are, you know, like, freedom fighters or whatever, stuff like that. Like, which, you know, it's not, a, it's not a falsifiable sort of thing. It's more of a point of view than it is, you know, a very obvious sort of propaganda. Right. Uh... So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So uh, I think the question was about Amrullah Saleh, but <laughs> I sort of digressed. Mm-hmm. I, I I think India is definitely on board with whatever he's doing. Um, I'm not sure how much it'll help, just because they don't have that link to Tajikistan, uh, as in the Panchiris don't have that link to Tajikistan the way they used to. Um, but I think definitely in terms of lobbying and you know maybe trying to isolate the Taliban things like that. India is definitely very much on board. Um, I'm not sure about the United States right now, but it's it's possible. But I haven't seen positive proof of it. Sure. All right. So let's uh, let's ra- wrap up with kind of a uh, little bit more kind of silly questions here, sort of lighten the mood a little bit. Um, so we'll just kind of go through these quickly. We've been kind of going on for a little bit now. So this one says, "Have you guys got wind of the subreddit?" r slash bewitch the taliban where internet witches are planning to use their magic hex powers to kill allah should the ummah be concerned about this um so yeah i have heard of this uh, have you guys seen this yeah a little bit i, yeah. I saw the I saw, I saw the witch thing um uh i think someone posted it on twitter um you know if, if they're trying to kill allah then you know i'm not worried because that's <laughs> yeah good possible. luck <laughs> but um you know in in, in terms of <laughs> <laughs> in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, I have seen you know stuff like you know this is trying to say you know like kind of bewitching the Taliban or doing black magic or whatever. But um, <laughs> I don't know. I guess I guess if you're a supporter of the Taliban, you'd better you know you'd better get all your prayers in before you go to sleep and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, pretty funny stuff. I I saw one post that was like, oh, I tried to do some kind of magic thing. I forgot what it was and. Uh, Watch out, guys. Allah is very powerful. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Pretty funny. <laughs> I don't really know, like, what they're... What, yeah. the, what do they experience where they come... Like, they talk about this stuff. It's very weird. Is it is it, like, a serious group, or is it just sort of, like, shitposting? I because think it's probably a combination. I assume that's what My impression is that it's, like, probably, like, teenagers, you know? Oh, I see. Yeah. Well... Well, I, I I don't know I don't know much about these sorts of subcultures or whatever, but like, I'm I'm pretty sure there's sort of like a there there's sort of, sort of like you know like I'm pretty sure there's like TV shows and stuff like that nowadays where they have like you know uh, this sort of ma- magical sort of subculture. I think there was like a show on Netflix or something, and like you know I, I heard of you know kids basically trying to do spells or whatever. But, you know you know how it is. Even even like when. Harry Potter was made. A lot of people were, were worried that it was going to encourage people to become, you know, to, to practice yeah, magic yeah. and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of, at least, a, a lot of groups in the United States. I remember back then. But <clears throat> I don't know. I've, I've heard that there's that there's um, there's some show on Netflix, and I know this because 
uh, one of my friend's sisters used to watch it, but there's a some show where they basically have like you know the sort of um, occult sort of stuff. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think it's just kids. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my impression. <laughs> I think it's too. just kids. It's just like answer. goofy kids, and then they're yeah. trying to like I imagine, you know, it's all online, you know, so they like post online to each other, and if, like they, I don't know, they're just trying to like one up each other and like prove their, you know, their credentials <laughs> as witches yeah, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, if 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 I would advise all um, all supporters of the Taliban to get their prayers in every night and they should be fine yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah okay so this next one is for me it says tom do you think that the islamic emirate of afghanistan giving women the chance to prove they cannot read by allowing to to foolishly pursue an <laughs> academic let me read this again this is kind of a mess uh tom do you think that the islamic emirate of afghanistan giving women the chance to prove they cannot read by allowing them to foolishly pursue an academic career is a negative blow to female rights in afghanistan aren't they just playing with them right now so i think what they're trying to say is like isn't it a bad idea for female rights in afghanistan for them to like push for education and, and schooling and stuff given that you know they can't read, so trying to teach them to read is, is not going to work out very well. I don't know. It'll it'll be interesting to see how this uh, this plays out. But that's a good point. How this plays out. Um, so the good thing is that no one can read this. <laughs> yeah. No one who would be annoyed at this can read this. Um, and so the last one here says, "Will you guys make some Kabuli Palau, the national dish of Afghanistan, in honor of the Taliban rightfully taking back control of Afghanistan?" Um, I don't know if I'll make it, but maybe I'll order some or something. Um, I do like. Uh, I don't know, like Afghan food in general is pretty good. Yeah, I like it. It's a. Uh, it's. it's... It's not. It's not over. It's not overdone in any yeah. sense. Like it's not. There's not too many spices. There's not too many weird things. It's generally nice and economical. <laughs> sure, I, I like <clears throat> that. It's sort of a combo yeah. of like Persian food and like Pakistani food. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, their rice, I've always really liked. To yeah. To, I, I would just sit and eat a whole plate of that. Yeah, a lot of a lot of good flavors. Happy. They have one uh, dish that we like to make somewhat frequently called ash which is just a really simple kind of soup with uh, like ground we usually mm-hmm. use ground turkey probably these days but you know i think traditionally it's like beef or lamb um yeah I forget what else goes in there but it sort of has like a spaghettios kind of like flavor profile <laughs> it's uh it's like a nice oh, yeah. comfort food yeah kind of uh, okay i'm not sure about this particular one but i was gonna say i think it's uh I think it's like originally from like you know these sort of Turkic sort of countries, but I might be wrong actually. I might be mixing it up with something else. <clears throat> but so a uh, kabuli pullout is that like a, like so the plout means is like rice or something? Right? Yeah, is it's that, a rice you know, like dish. A rice yeah. um, you know, usually some kind of meat, and then kabuli style, like the Afghan style of rice, they'll often have like raisins in it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, cool. Yeah, I just looked up Osh, and uh, people are calling it Afghan chili, which kind of I I can see that it, it's got noodles in it too. So yeah, yeah. I I've had it like just once the uh, four years ago. I went to this Iranian place. Um, I think I was wrong. Actually. I think it's a Persian type of thing rather than Turkish. Yeah. But yeah, <clears throat> there's a lot of you know a lot of things rubbing shoulders in that region so yeah well listeners if you um you know you live in an area where there is an afghan restaurant nearby i suggest you go check it out and tell them how much you love the taliban (laughs) i'm sure they'll love that um yeah anyway thanks for coming on again ibrahim it's always uh very enlightening uh it's really great to have you on yeah it's great to have you on and uh thanks for your patience with everything too and uh no, 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 thank, it all thank worked you guys. Out in the um, end, so, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. All right, uh, have a good, uh, have a good night. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, so yeah, guys, thanks for listening. If you want to catch a second episode of the podcast every week, you can get that by subscribing to our Patreon, where you'll get the second episode as well as access to our Discord, where you can chat with us in our lovely community. 
And if you want to send us anonymous questions, go to the Twitter account at You Can't Win Pod, and there's a link to the Curious Cat pin there. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next week. Thanks, guys. Bye.